What is Obery and What Does It Matter? by John McTemus of the Obery Project. It has been brought to my attention recently that it has been some time since I've produced any real definitive information concerning Obery, what it is exactly, and why it is as important to grasp and begin to utilize as it is. I will try to the best of my abilities and current knowledge level to do that herein. Plainly stated, Obery is the language of the Bible in its purest possible form. What we know of today as Biblical Hebrew is a language within a language, or atop the pure language of the Bible. It is a system contrived, as we are told, by rabbis called Masoretes between the 7th and 10th centuries AD, or more properly, this is the time frame in which they were said to have standardized it, although it's very obvious that they've been, quote, standardizing it as late as just a century ago. What Masoretic has done is to not only change the sound and look of the language, but it also has parsed or divided the same word often into varied, sometimes quite different words. It also dictates similarities that may or may not exist in different words, and frequently classifies clearly distinct words together, such as Cushi, a man in David's kingdom, along with Cushi, as in an Ethiopian, who were never Cushi or Cushites, under the same listing, Strong's H. 3569. And lastly, it dictates grammar, word meaning and use, i.e. nouns, verbs, adjectives, and so on. These influences, that Masoretic or so-called Hebrew, the word itself being a Masoretic contrivance, has had on the pure text form are of far greater significance than we've been led to believe. Adam Clark, a well-known 18th and 19th century Bible scholar, is alleged to have said that the Masora, which includes but is not limited to Nikudot, being all the dots and dashes added to the pure character form, are the longest-running commentary on the Hebrew Bible. If he did indeed say this, he's certainly not alone, as scores of marginalized Bible scholars have intimated or outright accused in the direction of the Masora and the rabbinic excuses for it. And what are those excuses for the presence of this parasitic language accessory? Let us begin there. It is claimed in all standard mainline Jewish reference books that the Masora was simply a system of annotations employed from the earliest times, most claim as early as Ezra the priest and scribe, to essentially keep the books of the Old Testament in a standard, coherent form. Here I must paraphrase for the sake of time, but please do go read what they say in their sources, such as Encyclopedia Judaica, Jewish Encyclopedia, etc. What it boils down to is that they make a number of unsubstantiated claims concerning what they claim was the state of the Old Testament, including changes made by men such as Ezra. And since no one understood the mysteries of this unreadable text, the rabbis, being the great saints they imagined themselves to be, employed Masorah to keep the text of the Old Testament intact, just as G-D intended. What they claim is that the rabbis began making markings to signal word spacing and placing various notes in the text, simply to help one to better understand, thus looking out for the little guy who may not have been aware of how disorganized and confusing G-D was. These notes, as they say, became the foundation of how Hebrew is interpreted today. Its sound, its look, its grammar, and its lexicon. Eventually, vowel markings were inserted, as their story goes, to preserve the traditions of pronunciation since, according to them, Hebrew has no vowels, and therefore all the pronunciations have always been passed down via tradition. 
Luckily for us, these traditions have been kept in trust by our friends, the rabbis. These problems, of course, could only be problems, however, if their claims were true. And we have no reason to believe they are. In fact, they've offered all of no proof whatsoever to affirm these pretexts, nor is there a shred of biblical evidence that any scribe, prophet, or chronologist at any time changed anything about the text. What this comes down to is, if you believe these Jewish rabbis about what a mystery and mess the text used to be, and how it has been made accessible by their efforts via their lens, their mazora, you are now entirely at their mercy when it comes to understanding anything and everything about the Old, and you'd better believe, the New Testament. Something that cannot be overstated is that these Masoretic rabbis are in no way distinct from the same rabbis who have produced the Kabbalistic writings, the Talmuds and Zohars, and all forms of sadistic, mystical, anti-Christian, and, well, really, anti-everyone writings. This means, in no certain terms, that everyone out there who uses both the pronunciations generated by these rabbis, such as Yahweh, Hebrew, Yeshua, Torah, etc., and the literary form and function dictated by them, i.e., syntax, verb conjugations, gender specifications, noun tenses, and forms et al., are using an inorganic system generated by these rabbis as a means of coming between the reader and the pure form and message of the text. Since most people only see the rabbis' nikudot, those dots and dashes above, below, and amid the characters, and the modern block text, which does vary significantly from the older forms of the language, they may tend to believe that look and pronunciation are the only manipulations that Masoretic brings to the text. How big a deal is it really that the, quote, letters look a bit different and sound a bit different. You may have a nice Hebrew tattoo from your favorite Bible verse, or you might like the sound of Yahweh or Yahuwah as opposed to Yahweh. Maybe I'm making too big a deal out of things that are trivial and superficial. Remember, there are two factors here that aren't as visible, that are undergirding this scam, and those, along with the not insignificant alteration of the look and sound of the language, are the very dangerous elements to Masoretic Hebrew. One is the aforementioned claim that the text and language was unreadable without all of their additions, adjustments, and modifications, and the other is just how many changes they've effected via those nikudot you see in nearly every Hebrew Old Testament. Even versions and fragments we have of Old Testament books without nikudot in them are never interpreted apart from our modern understanding of the Old Testament via the Masoretic Nikud. Pay attention to the linguistic meanderings of any Bible scholar, especially the ones responsible for all our available translations and current digital tools, and you'll notice their foundations and extrapolations invariably go back to the Masoret. The Nikidot, far beyond just pronunciation, dictate grammar, and the very meanings of words. This took them a very long time to get just right and standardized. Ergo, the Masoretic wasn't even a standardized system until only a few brief centuries ago. Nor was Hebrew, a language synonymous with Jewry, until the early 1900s. Jewish sources tend to minimize the fact that there was no concrete standardization of the Mazora 
until recently. It does make one wonder just how many libraries had to be ransacked and burnt down in order to keep such a scant amount of official manuscripts and fragments in circulation. Most of what we accept and understand today, via the Masoretic Old Testament, has come down through one man, Aaron ben Moses ben Asher who is credited with the Aleppo Codex. Until his ideas were applied to the Leningrad Codex, and thus agreed upon by organized Jewry, there was no universal agreement within organized Jewry on the correct application of Mazora. This is further reflected in the scant lexicons produced before the 20th century, often drawing on all manner of linguistic sources in their handling of biblical Hebrew. Although their official sources very much downplay the universal lack of agreement and application of Mazora, and really just about anything and everything, they nevertheless are forced to cite innumerable examples of it in their works concerning Masora, languages, and linguists. All of these relevant details may be found easily enough. It's not my desire to argue or cite them here, but to best help you understand why you must not trust the mode and form in which the Bible has been presented to us. So, to review, what do we know about the Bible in Masoretic Hebrew? One, the text itself looks different than older fragments and artifacts we have, and was therefore changed into what is now deemed Biblical Hebrew. We don't know for certain who did this, but all things considered, the Masoretes are the prime suspect. Two, it likely sounds very different to the original. If the wild variations of vocalizations were not the smoking gun, there's also the fact that the original Obery glyph set so closely resembles our modern Western alphabets. The order is strikingly similar and the glyphs in original form bear an uncanny resemblance to our own in look sound, and order, and it has five vowels, just like our modern alphabets. Even the names they've imposed onto the glyphs, not letters, is simply another distraction from how much Obery and Western European dialects resemble one another. All the Masoretic rules of voicings simply serve to detract from the obviousness that Obery is the predecessor to our Western European languages. 3. Its rules of grammar are inconsistent. Therefore, often excuses are made for these various inconsistencies, including ignoring them altogether at times. 4. Its lexicon is based on the nicodote applied by Masoretes, thus changing word meaning at whim and categorizing words as it suited them. This often resulted in the arbitrary division of the same word, or the same meaning being applied to very different words. There is no complete agreement between their lexicons, as often they would be influenced by what other language the author most preferred. 5. Quote, standardization is a myth. And even though a general consensus was reached relatively recently, there is still contention over the standardized system because of its many still present inconsistencies. 6. Masoretic Hebrew assigns numbers to the glyphs, or letters as they call them, and use this gematria to often interpret the Bible. The original Obery has no numerical assignments to glyphs. Numbers are words such as Ahad, Shanim, Shalash, etc. 
and 7. All aspects to the Masoretic Bible and all who've brought it to us are, without controversy, all entirely Jewish. At this point, some may say, well, then it's a good thing we have the Septuagint. And I might honestly agree except for the fact that there is, again, no proof it was written when and how it's claimed in the letter of Aristeus. In fact, all evidence points to it being created much later. And though we are able to use it for some limited checks and balances, it clearly employs many of the same word parsings, meanings, and phonetic renderings dictated by the Masoretic. Do those facts not support the accuracy of the Masoretic text? No. All they do is tell us that the same people, with the same agenda, had their hands in bringing both to us. But what about the fact that Yusho, or Jesus, and others in the New Testament quote more from the Septuagint translation? That argument is a trick. If quotations in most copies of the New Testament follow the Septuagint better than the Masoretic, the most that that means is that there were texts they knew of that were closer in structure and form to the Septuagint than the very limited copies we have of so-called Hebrew. It doesn't prove that Yusho spoke Greek or that there was any Greek translation in their day. And this goes for all other texts, the Samaritan Pentateuch, Peshitta, Targums, and whatever other texts may exist, none of them actually help the Masoretic beyond showing that the structure has remained basically the same, and in the case of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that often the wording, letter for letter, has remained mostly intact. Those facts say nothing in defense of the aforementioned points against the Mazora, which is the inorganic system we all view the text through. You see, something that may get a mention as you go, but without the deep implications being drawn out, is, for one, the fact that Obri or Hebrew has no capital letters nor punctuation. This means that you have to rely on the rabbis to tell you when Adam is man in general, or the Adam of the garden, or Edom as an Esau, or red, reddish, or a sardia stone, and when Adam A, with the simple E suffix, is soil, or a city's proper name, Adma, or one of the Adam variations with a softening or generalizing E suffix. And that's just one word this can be done with. Is it important to know if it's man, or something red, or Esau being spoken of? But we can sort that out based on context, using rules of grammar and proper syntax, right? Certainly. But whose rules? Are we using the rabbi's rules that don't always work? Are we going to trust the set of rules regarding tenses, voices, and conjugations that are often so inconsistent that they are still argued over, albeit quietly, as they wouldn't want anyone to get wind of the fact that their system isn't based on consistent, repetitive text forms, but extensive Masoretic notes that have been solidified by way of a complex system of varying dots and dashes and fluctuating lexicons? If at this point you're saying, yes, I'm fine with that system, then there's likely no way of helping you get any more understanding of the Bible than the Masoretic rabbis will allow. If you're willing to believe the same letter can bear six different sounds and that a word can be in different meanings and all by the whim of Jewish rabbis then there isn't much you won't believe from them.
But if you're ready to go past their fences, their artificial barriers, their modifications, and morphing their sleight of hand, their hiding of the real truth to be found within the Bible, then you're ready to start examining the Bible in Obery. But what is Obery again? Obri, for one, is the word that Hebrew was derived from without any Masoretic influence. It is pertaining to things including language associated with the patriarch Ober, who was three generations after Shem and six generations before Abram. He is where the tongue of the Oberim came from. He was contemporary to the Babel incident in Genesis 11, and his ancestors became known as Oberim and spoke the language of the Oberim. Now, some may argue, based on the form of other languages' names in the Bible, that it should be called Obrit. However, Obri is not entirely inappropriate and would depend on the context. Besides, the instances that we see Obrit in the Bible are referring to the Obri women. I'll digress from there, just know that even those who speak Hebrew know it's perfectly acceptable to call it Hebrew or Ibrit. So, if Obrit just suits you down to the ground, crack on. What the term Obri generally pertains to is the tongue, culture, and all else having to do with the subject people of the Bible. How does Obery function? First off, the Obery alphabet, or glyph set, is an arranged group of 22 glyphs, icons, or characters that not only have an extraordinarily close phonetic character to our modern Proto-Indo-European, Germanic, English, and other Western European tongues, but also bear striking resemblances. To them. In fact, if one removed all the diaphones, like C is a diaphone of K and S, and Y is a diaphone of I or E, and derivative letters such as F and J in the aforementioned Western European languages alphabets, what would be left is an alphabet of remarkable similarity to the Obery glyph set. When one looks into all obtainable pre mazora examples of so-called Hebrew, the Western vowels are very obvious to see, as they also bear a striking similarity to the European vowels. Careful etymological searches reveal that we English-speaking Europeans have still held on to a number of our old Obri words. Maher is maro, Aher is after. Been between, ober is over, as in to cross. Paris is parse, sup is sup, as in to sup one's final meal of the day. Quell has become collect, collate, coalition, etc., and it is likely the basis for the Greek word ecclesia or church. And on and on it goes. Even people's names and terms have strong indications of an Obri origin. Gaelic, or Celts, derived from Galut, or the expulsion of the ten tribes comprising the House of Israel. Irish, Scottish, English, Welsh, Dutch, Deutsch, Danish, Swedish, etc. all bear the suffix ish, or aish, man. Even Saxon most likely derived from Yitzhak, Isaac, or Tzahakun, like Isaac. And it's entirely arguable that even the term German was derived from Ger, to sojourn, and Mahne, a camp, and Germani, being of the camp or camps of sojourner, Germany, like Yudi. Yishrali, Aprati, etc. The nature and function of Obri, to the best of my current understanding, is as follows. 
It is a language not comprised of thin, meaningless, so-called letters, but of meaningful, elemental ideograms, or glyphs. These glyphs are not simple symbols, such as, this one is an ox, that one is a foot, but represent ideas and cannot stand alone without the presence of a second glyph. This is one of the great weaknesses in the ideology of those who profess to teach ancient or Paleo-Hebrew. Them, like their Masoretic predecessors, keep the language imprisoned by offering ideas about it that do not practically work. If ich, the Obery equivalent to our letter Y or I, or Yad as they call it, represented a hand, there would be no need to have words like Yad, being, hand, force, or influence. We'd just say or write the single glyph Ich or Y for hand, or B for house. But we don't, and you'll never see an Obery glyph by itself, except the cantillation marks that rabbis have inserted into the text, and they only have meaning to the rabbis, not apart from them, and certainly not original to the text. Again, why does it take two or more glyphs to form a bona fide obri word? Because they are ideas or concepts that need at least a second idea or concept to solidify their intent and meaning. If I said to you, big, you'd have nothing to go on. However, if I said, you're big, he's big, or big deal, you'd then have a coherent expression to work with. Even the latter of the three, being more an expression than complete thought, allows for the receiver's mind to formulate action or imagery, and thus intent. S, the glyph called Samic by the rabbis, carries with it the idea of a curve. This is obvious in our modern S. Add N, which bears the idea of flow in front of S, and you have a waving banner. Add B, which bears the idea of spatial relevance depending on its position in a word, at the end of S, and you have to compass or go around. Glyphs carry ideas with them, and when added together, can convey thoughts, ideas, actions, and concepts. A good question is, are the glyphs representing things, or actions, or descriptions? The answer to that is yes. Example. Although most modern words in these over-embellished yet absent of inherent meaning languages we speak can't adequately demonstrate the depth of how obery works, we still have a few words hanging on, such as broadside, named so because it's a side and broad and is an action as it articulates a thing done in a general way. A broadside, broadsides, a broadside. It is what I would call in Obri a complete or universal word. Even as another modern word, not far from the Obri word Orib, the even is even because it's even. One houses a house in a house. Something is last because it lasts down to the last one. Most Obery words I've examined fall within this category, and without claiming to know which is first, a thing is because it does, or it does because it is. Therefore, its attribute or attributes exist because of what it is, and its attributes are because what it is is what it does. Once we grasp the way the mind thinks, in concepts, not phrases, and realize a language once existed and still does, tailored to best suit the way our mind was designed, then we come closer to understanding and utilizing Obery as it was intended. Furthermore, communication is, or certainly ought to be, basic. Though there is room in Obery for embellishing and lofty verbiage, 
it is also very well equipped for getting to the point in the most cerebral, adaptive way possible. Remember, sounds or symbols go into the mind where processing is done apart from formalities like sentences. The least number of parts needed to complete a thought in the mind of the receiver is two. For example, I went in first person singular, be quiet in second person, or they did in third person plural. Because the mind thinks in concepts, often trivialities like of and certain tenses are not always required. Therefore, Obery doesn't often present words in the same tense and with the same modifiers we do. Often a thing will be modified by placing another thing before it. Tsuba of a ram is just a ram tsuba, no of word. Also terms like he shade would be translated beasts of the field for ease of English reading, but in Obery there is no of or the in there. There are of course times when we will see phrases that demand of, do more to the wide application of of than a direct equivalency. Bishene, shalush, melakut, balashatzer is more often translated in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. But in Obery, it's the article L preceding Malkut, mechanically meaning to in English becoming of, that is telling us in Obery that the third year is to the kingdom of Belshazzar. These articles, like the B that precedes Shanae, or year, are allowing our minds to envision and organize correctly in a time and spatial way. Elek Kudmat Asher, or that goeth to the east of Assyria, is another in which the T at the end of Kadem is directing our minds spatially. Again, a good language should be able to generate the exact thoughts, ideas, concepts, and relays from the mouth or pen of the bearer into the mind of the receiver. These relays can be simple. La mensa mazamur ledud, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. Or complex, such as the psalms that will go on for many verses of space without using the article you to break or begin a new separate thought, but instead will build expression upon expression, question upon question, before any significant break occurs. The mind of the reader or hearer will tend to achieve the same state of exasperation as the author who had wished to communicate such things. In this way, the author's desperation and suffocation is aptly communicated. Mission accomplished. But having said all these things about the way a language ought to function and giving examples with translations, the truth of it is that in these examples I've been providing Anglo-Jewish renderings of the language based on Masora. Without challenging this foundation, we are stuck. Thus, I present Theoretical Obri, a means of textual examination without the Masora whatsoever. It is based on reasoning, and that reasoning based on what may be extrapolated from what body of text can be understood as ideas least likely to have been changed or influenced by the Masoretes. You see, not everything could have been altered or influenced by the rabbis. Words that appear hundreds of times in similar but varying contexts can't be altered too much without it becoming obvious what is going on. Therefore, a large amount of the text had to remain at least very close to its original meaning, or else the jig would be up. This isn't to suggest the rabbis and Western language scholars did not alter 
a word's rendering from one occurrence to the next, but that they only had so much play before their machinations would be abundantly apparent. Verses like Exodus 20.13, La Terraza, only allows for so much variation over and beyond not murder. Given the fact that La, no or not, appears over 500 times, and Terraza, murder or slay, nearly 50 times, and within other contexts, and has varied cognates. So if they'd tried to insert, say, wash or execute, instead of the more appropriate slay or murder, it would be apparent, such as the KJV's use of the inappropriate kill. Then, based on a great deal of text within the Old Testament that we can count on being able to understand, we can ascertain that it was written by authorized men in a consistent language created and kept intact for thousands of years by Yahweh, the Elohim or God of the Bible. It was intended for a certain people and preserved for this certain people. And although Jewish Masoretic rabbis have changed the look of the glyphs and added Mazora, including Nikudot, thus changing features of the text. Other examples have been kept intact, as have the people it was written by and for, thereby giving us the tools to reconstruct the original intent and use of the language. The only way a language can be understood, apart from a system like Masora and its assertions and lexicons, is if the language itself were self-defining. That is, if there were meaning inherent in the language itself. This is, theoretically, exactly what Obery is, a language with built-in meaning, thereby rendering the Masora and all other inorganic alterations moot. But how can a language have this feature? It does this at its base level, as has been already stated, via the glyph. The glyph represents an idea. That idea is combined with other ideas which cause a specific thought, idea, or concept to emerge. This is the simple to-glyph or by-glyph root. That now developed concept is further refined via articles affixed or additional roots being combined to form mature roots or compound roots. All these root types are then combined with one another using additional articles to signal word type and arrangement and thus a complete thought is created and subsequently communicated. What we're able to currently do is see and document patterns in these things, though as of yet the complete understanding and explanation is still elusive. For example, M can be witnessed as being associated with many words associated with water, multiplicity, and or chaos, as well as present tense being or movement when appearing late in a word. Yam is sea. Mayam, waters. Yam as the plural suffix, as in nerim, or rivers. Agam is pool. Dam is blood. Ham is churn, heat, or a thing mixed, etc. And when appearing early, it has much to do with derivatives. It is often seen as a prefixed article and translated as from, indicating source. It also tends to form a type of noun from a verb, attribute, or another noun, such as maober, being crossing, from ober, across, or mabua, being entrance, from bua, enter. We see preeminence in a we see spatial projection inward or outward in B. We see verticals in G, and so on. So there are real patterns, relationships, and effects of these glyphs, but to fully realize them is simply 
a process that takes time. Now, some may find this really big and complicated, and I'm certainly not trying to complicate it any worse than it already is. I mean, it's still an unknown language that differs from what we're used to knowing in languages. But I'll give you a rubber-meeting-the-road example that I hope will really help to illustrate the potential of looking at the language of the Oberim in this way. Some of this will be examining the character and roots, and some will be ways of cross-referencing. All means and techniques are good to know and use. Let's just say you're looking at the whole idea of dinosaurs in the Bible, as many claim there are references to dinosaurs therein. So, you read that they are described in the book of Job, Job chapter 40, to be precise, verse 15. So, you open up your e-sword and reference Job 40.15 on the good old, many would say flawless, KJV Bibles tab. And there it is. Behold, now, behemoth. Behemoth is an interesting word. What's a behemoth exactly? So you switch to the KJV Plus Bibles tab and click on it. H930 comes up down below. So you see it presented in its backward Jewish form as behemoth. And because of the rabbinical Jewish mazorah attached to it, says it should be pronounced be he moth. However, if you understand that Obri pronunciations are similar and very much like our European languages, you reference it in the Obri Strong's list provided at obriproject.info at the Resources tab. Besides the ease of now reading it from left to right, you find by using the key at the top of the Obery Strong's list that it should likely be pronounced Bemut. B E M U T. Bemut. Now you go on to defining it. Brown Driver and Briggs, which is based on Jacinius Hebrew lexicon, says 1. Perhaps an extinct dinosaur. 1a. A Diplodocus or Brachiosaurus exact meaning unknown. Then at the bottom it reads, in form, a plural of H929, but really a singular of Egyptian derivation. I'm not too sure about that whole of Egyptian derivation part. That starts getting back to those spurious claims and mysteries only the rabbis can solve. This, too, is besides the fact that neither is Egypt anywhere in the Old Testament, nor is there any provable Egyptian influence on the Old Testament. So, moving forward, the most obvious feature of this entry on Behemoth, or Bemut more properly, is that Brown Driver Briggs claims it to likely be derivative of H929, Beme, B E M E, or Behema, according to the Masoretes, which appears almost 200 times and is variously translated as cattle, beast, beasts. Now that's interesting. What would we find if we ran a Control F search in the Obery Old Testament, also available at obreyproject.info, for the exact same word? As found in Job 40.15. It first appears as the exact same word from Job 40.15, Bamut, in Deuteronomy 32.24. I will also send the teeth of beasts, Bamut, upon them. Do you suppose Yahweh would send brachiosaurs against them? Would brachiosaurs attack or act carnivorously? Would cattle, for that matter. Next, we find an occurrence in Joel 120. The beasts, or bemut, of the field cry also unto thee. And again, in Joel 222. Be not afraid, ye beasts, bemut, 
of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. Who would have thought that there were dinosaurs grazing in the fields of Palestine in Joel's day? Also, Isaiah 36, the burden of the beasts, Bamut of the south, into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion. This verse, if one knows what to look for, is loaded with possibilities for translational variation. There are words claimed to be nouns that could be verbs and or proper nouns. It has various words with very few occurrences that could very well be something entirely different. These are also the opportunities Obri presents. It next appears in Micah 5.8, And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts, Bemut, of the forest. Next, Habakkuk 2.17, For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts, Bemut. And Jeremiah 12.4, How long shall the land mourn, and the herbs of every field wither, for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts, Bemut, are consumed. Another verse fraught with problems and potential. Job 12.7, but ask now the beasts, Bamut, and they shall teach thee. And Job 35.11, Who teacheth us more than the beasts, Bamut, of the earth, and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven? That's the very same book as our target word. Psalm 8.7, And the beasts, Bamut, of the field, and Psalm 49, 12, and 20, he is like the beasts, Bamut, that perish. Psalm 50, 10, for every beast, Bamut, of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. And finally, Psalm 73, 22, so foolish was I, and ignorant, I was as a beast. Bamut before thee. Incidentally, Shade, translated as field, is an entirely domestic term. Therefore, a number of times we see Bamut translated behemoth in Job 40.15, as claimed by a great many lexicons, Bible commentaries, and teachers today to be some sort of dinosaur, with the modifier Shade of the field, thus implying domestication. This presentation would quickly become epic if I were to even begin to talk about the issues of wording potential present in all those verses, but there we have 14 examples of the exact same word in similar contexts, and not one other instance is bold enough to use the loaded term behemoth. So, why the distinction in Job 40.15? Mostly, the difference is in the nicudote. Therefore, we're having rabbinic opinion forced upon us without our consent. And every Bible translation in existence is either perfectly fine with that or ignorant of its ramifications. And I must seriously doubt the latter. We could go on to examine the text around and after Job 40.15 to help us fully determine what is in fact being spoken of as Bamut, which again, in the present context, we don't have time for. Were this a personal study session, that would also be done, and there are many loaded and obscure words throughout the passage in question. We can, however, using just the Obery glyphs and cross-referencing, boil Bamut down a bit and see what emerges. One thing that is no small matter is the effect that articles and or prefixed, suffixed, and affixed glyphs can have on the text. In Job 40.15, Yahweh is saying, Ene na Bamut, which may well be Take consideration now, I pray, 
in the death, as bemut can literally be in the death, as H4191-94 through mut, M-U-T, is death, and it's presented quite often as emut, and B is a prefixed article meaning near, in, or by. And it's not uncommon to see phrases that, mechanically translated, have a verb followed by a B prefix on a noun. Consider the death. Or, look in the land. Or, go to in the people. This happens often and is just adjusted to make a language that has many terms and expressions that sometimes feel very difficult in English flow better for the English reader. It's also well worth noting that H4962 listed as mut, M-T, and typically translated as men of a sort, would very possibly have some relationship to mut, and even appears in very similar form to the bemut of Job 40.15, as in Bemati, B M T Y. Also, H 1993 listed as Eme, E M E, and translated roar, noise, or disquieted, and is a cognate of M H 1990, the name of a region near Yam et Oribe, or the Sea of the Plain, from which a type of fierce giant once inhabited and may still have borne a similar title in at least Job's time. We can also go back to H929, listed as Beme, and translated beast or cattle. Just from running a check on all the listings of H929 Beme, in Esword, it is interesting to note that when it appears as Bemet, B-E-M-T, is Bemut minus the U, and the frequent dropping of U is the most copious demonstrable phenomenon of variation or copyist's blunder in the same word. When Bema appears as Bemet, it either seems to be redundant such as in Genesis 36, 6, and his cattle, and all his beasts, Bemet, and all his substance, as Machne, cattle, or Canin, acquisitions, or substance, would seem to be sufficient, which appear before and after Bemet, or beasts. Or it seems in very odd company, as in Exodus 20:10 which list people types, then Bemet, then people again. Thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, Bemet, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. And there are many other oddities having to do with calling H929 Bema cattle and or beasts exclusively. Now I'm not drawing any conclusions about Bamut in this brief and inexhaustive study as it only serves as an example, though from what little I've discovered by using my Obery Strong's List, Obery Old Testament, Esword, and a good understanding of common articles and common glyph affixations and eliminations, I certainly could begin forming some solid theories to then further test using the same tools and perhaps a good etymological dictionary. Don't get me wrong. The techniques of examining the Bible in Obery and potentials as far as theory or variation in translations is not presented herein to even begin to suggest that we know nothing of the original language and its intent, nor that the Bible as it is currently available to us is wrought with error. For as I stated earlier, because it is written in a stable language filled with linguistic patterns, there is really only so much 
that the Masoretic was able to manipulate before it would be blatantly obvious, which surprisingly much still is and is not called out more often by so-called scholars. These patterns in the text have not only restrained the vulgarity of the Masoretes, but also have afforded us a decent amount of text we know must still be intact to a degree, text we can work from. For if a word, article, prefix, etc. appears a thousand times and is translated a thousand times in the same or notably similar way while working in varied contexts, the odds are that it is a very close representation of the original intent of that word, article, prefix, etc. By utilizing the concept of obri, we can now test all assumptions, all rules, all words, all articles. We can find out if they are hiding a location's proper name under a common word entry, thus disorienting us. If they are hiding the repetition of words within commonly provable variations, thus limiting our understanding of any given word. If all their applied conjugations are consistent, thus drastically changing the events being relayed to us. If they have obscured large portions of the prophets through their demands of vocabulary, thus hiding the unfolding of Yahweh's great plan. If they've in fact misrepresented the character of Yahweh through relatively simple word replacement, thus causing many to shy away from him before even finding out about him. And even if they have, via their nikudot, applied codes that can be discovered and exposed as malicious, thus exposing them as the true enemies of Yahweh and his covenant people. We can test the meaning carried by glyphs via their use as articles and in their smallest form as a decided concept, the biglyph root. We can begin to formulate answers to why words that are said to be verbs appear with articles said to be noun-specific, and vice versa. We can begin to understand language as it was meant to be, wherein a noun must be linked to its action and attributes. We can also, by way of abandoning the Masoretic vocalizations in favor of the obvious Obery phonetics, begin to more accurately pursue these words' true etymological histories. We will rewrite the concordances and lexicons based on the provable meanings of the glyph set and the relationships within the roots until both a concordance and lexicon is regarded as illegitimate tools of the ages of darkness. We will, through understanding and an application of the truth, leave no room for the works of darkness, the secrets of the priesthood, the abuses of our enemies, the injustices of a world saturated in the gospel of the equality of ignorance, the absence of knowing the character and mind of the Aliyim of the Bible. All the obscured wisdom of ages of time are waiting for us to find them out. Therefore, I offer you Obri. For the Obri Project, I'm John MacTemus.